Hi, everybody. I'm Diane Brady. I'm here with Sean Donovan, who is the new CEO and president of Enterprise Community Partners. You may know him as the former Secretary of Housing and Urban Development. I think you're also director in the um, U.S. Office of Management and Budget. I remember you ran for mayor. Welcome, Sean. Great to be with you. So I think you're uh, six weeks into this job now. So uh, what have you accomplished so far? <laughs> Well, I've definitely put some miles. Uh, I, I've been in 10 cities around the country and uh, deeply engaged in trying to understand not only enterprise, uh, it's an organization I've had the honor to work with uh, as a partner for 30 years, probably of its more than 40 years, but it's also uh, grown incredibly, is deeply engaged in a whole set of new endeavors that I'm that I'm learning about. But you know, the other thing I would say is what I'm seeing is, despite my 30-year career in housing and community development, I have never seen the challenges this deep or this broad. It, you know, it used to be that in a place like New York or LA or San Francisco, housing was expensive. Now it's literally everywhere you go around the yeah country. and and affordability i mean i can't i can't afford to buy right now what i would like to buy in new york city so i think affordability has become a whole different conceit in this climate um before we get into sort of the challenges with housing sean i want to ask a little bit more about you and your journey to this because uh, you also worked in the bloomberg administration a lot of people when they leave government um you know, and maybe you did this already. It's a ticket to go to the private sector and make gobs of money. So why did you choose this? Of all the gin joints, why this one? Well, look, um, if, you, if you really want to go to the roots of, of why I do this work, it's because I'm a New York City kid. I grew up watching my hometown really fall apart. I, I watched the South Bronx burn. I watched homelessness explode on the streets, more and more of my neighbors. Uh, I was passing on my walk to school uh, as they were living on the streets and it woke something up. It, it mm. made me start asking questions about how it could be in the wealthiest country, the wealthiest city on earth. Um, we allow our neighbors to sleep on the streets. And, and that really started uh, a focus on on housing, on on urban issues, and um, I'm lucky to have been able to have a career where I can focus on that passion uh, and that mission every single day. And 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 enterprise, I would say, is from my perspective the most interesting platform to do that. It's it's involved in every aspect of the housing issues, whether it's the 10 billion a year we put into communities whether it's the more than 25,000 people who live in communities that we own and manage, or the impact we can have through our policy advocacy. And, and going back to my roots, my first job was in the South Bronx, working with community organizations to rebuild those same neighborhoods I'd seen burning as a kid. Mm -hmm. We were built 41 years ago to partner with those community-based organizations to help them get the capital, the technical assistance, the know-how, to rebuild their communities with their vision, not, you know, not ours. We're here to facilitate their vision of how to rebuild. You know, one of the things that I think is often confusing to people is the difference between nonprofit and profit. So when you talk about like, um, talk about enterprise, where you make your money, and um, you, you've obviously alluded to this in terms of the mission, you've, you know, I, my understanding is you've built communities for what, a million? Is it a million houses? I can't even sure, I'm not even sure what you're up to we're, at this point. We're, uh, I'm, I'm not, spoiler alert, we're not We're not announcing uh, that we've reached a million yet. We're, we're just a few units away, but we're coming up on a million units yeah. uh, that we've been able to build or or invest in over the 41 year history. So, it's so an amazing but, record. Tell us about the business model in terms of how, because obviously you need capital to deploy capital. So. Talk about the ways in which you raise money. Yeah, it, it's one of the things uh, as well that's really unique about the, the platform. Uh, think about us as a nonprofit bank in some ways. We 
bring together investors from all across the country, you know, mission-oriented invested investors, market-oriented investors, and we give them ways to channel their funding into doing well and also doing good. We, we raise money, for example, we're the largest low-income housing tax credit investor in the country. We bring together capital to do that. We mm -hmm. have a big, what's called community development financial institution, which invests in, in housing and communities. So um, that's a big piece of what we do. And that has revenues and, and even what would otherwise be called profits. But what's different is those don't go to shareholders. Those go, those go back into community. So we reinvest every dollar we have into, for example, I was visiting a, a few weeks ago, an after school program we do in the Maryland uh, suburbs mm -hmm. in a low income community. Unbelievable work to see young children who were just a couple of years ago, refugees fleeing their home countries or uh, families that have been here in the in the US for generations who are able to benefit from those services. That's a, a lot of that is funded by our ability uh, to raise revenue from other things. But we're also a big philanthropically funded organization as well. Tens of millions of dollars a year is invested into our programs by philanthropic partners, uh, by corporate partners. And so we really are this remarkable blend of, I think, a very successful business and business model with um, a, a philanthropic focus. And, and again, because we're a nonprofit, what that means is that every dollar we raise from, from donors or that we earn from the work that we do goes back into community. Yeah. You know, one of the things, you're in New York City now, you said you grew up in New York. I've detected a shift. You know, New York has long been a sanctuary city. We've heard a lot from um, Mayor Eric Adams and others about this influx of migrants who've come through. And it seems to be changing the tone of the conversation around welcoming, um, you know, people who are lower income, because frankly, they come here with, with no income, often from very difficult situations back home. Have you noticed that shift yourself? Do you feel like, you know, New York and these other cities are, are at the crisis point that a lot of the politicians talk about? So there are, um, to your question, uh, and, and going back to something I said earlier, there are echoes of what I saw growing up in New York City, a sense of, and it's not just folks who are coming to the US uh, fleeing violence, fleeing economic uh, crisis, but it's also uh, an expanding homeless population, both here and across the country uh, more generally. And I, I am very concerned about it. And part of that is because the affordability crisis is worse than we've ever seen. Um, part of it is because we're seeing issues like the mental health crisis, which was exacerbated by COVID. Um, we, we have you know, fentanyl and other opioids that are driving addiction in ways that we haven't seen before. So I think there's a confluence of, of factors, but what I would say for me, as someone who's worked on these issues my, my whole life, I, I volunteered in a homeless shelter in college, and, mm -hmm. and that was part of how I got started in this work, is that what, what worries me the most is that we have people who are giving up on the fact that there are solutions. There, there are folks who may see people living on the streets around them and say, there, there aren't solutions to these problems. And the fact is, there are. And in fact, when I was housing secretary leading this the homeless strategy for the country, we made dramatic progress. We lowered family homelessness uh, uh, by about a third. We, we cut veteran homelessness in half. And there were more than 100 communities that literally ended veteran homelessness, not reduced it, but mm -hmm. ended it. Mm -hmm. And so my message would be that not to lose hope, that these are real challenges and that we can find ways not only to house people, to, but to get them into lives that really allow them to get up on their uh, on their feet and, and move forward economically contribute. Because ironically, when you when you talk about uh, migrants who are coming, you know, I'm first generation. I'm the son of an immigrant. Uh, but where did your parents immigrant from immigrate well, from um, my grandfather left 
the docks in London to go around the world to Africa, to South America. My father grew up in South America and came here to the to the U.S. Um, we need immigrants. We need workers in sure. the U.S. We need people who desperately want to work. And I think long term, the immigrants we have can be a, a benefit to the city and, and to the country. But we have to have a housing strategy uh, for every uh, American and, and uh, anybody who comes want, wanting to be uh, an American. We need solutions that I think we know, but we have to invest in and, and really work on. And that's where enterprise has the deep knowledge, the partnerships to be able to, to find those solutions so that we don't lose hope about the potential to solve it. You know, it's interesting. We always talk about what the public, uh, what the private sector can bring to the public sector, you know, more efficiency, yada, yada, yada. We rarely talk about what experience in the public sector can bring to leadership roles in the private sector. And I think of you in a role that is, you know, maybe a nonprofit, but clearly a, a private sector role. Um, what, what do you think about that in terms of your experience at both the municipal level, the federal level? How do you feel like that shifts your leadership style when you're in a role like this? Well, it's, it's a great question. And I would say um, the public sector is kind of un underappreciated for the skills that, that you learn. One of the things that I would say is that you learn that there isn't just one bottom line and that in the end, you have to meet both mission and keep the doors open, right? And that uh, tension, what I think of as often creative tension, is incredibly important at a, at a nonprofit and frankly, in, in doing the public good. Um, so that's one. Second, I would say you learn that you have many, many, uh, we call them stakeholders, right? Many uh, bosses a board of directors, you don't just have your investors, you have community stakeholders. And, and ultimately, what I learned it, in government, I often say, you know, the fastest way between two points isn't always a straight line. Mm -hmm. um, but you figure out how do you build consensus? How do you really make sure that a group of strange bedfellows often who might have very different perspectives can come together and do big things together. And, and Lord knows in this country right now, um, we've lost that civic ability in too many places to bring folks together who may think they're very different, who may disagree yeah. at the start, but help them figure out how to work together. And, and, and just to give you an example, this housing affordability crisis that we have, one of the reasons is because we're not building enough housing period. We have too many places where you're not allowed to build more density, where next to a railroad uh, stop or a, a, you know, a commuter line, you can only build single family houses, for example. And we've now got some really interesting coalitions that are coming together of private sector interests that want to build with advocates who are uh, sick and tired of low-income people being locked out of communities with good schools or with job opportunities. And those kind of bigger big tent coalitions, I would say, are really the thing that we need right now to be able to move this forward. And I think that's a, that's a skill that hopefully you learn in, uh, in, the, in the public sector. And then, you know, the last thing I, I would say on this is that there's a really important scale that comes with the work that we do uh, mm -hmm. in, in government. But there's also a humility where often I, I, I describe government could be like an aircraft carrier, right? It's, it's massive. The potential for impact is huge, but it doesn't turn so fast, right? Well, you and were in the so, Obama administration, which I know there was a lot of political uh, gridlock might be the right way to put it. Absolutely, there can be gridlock, but it is also that uh, you can make real progress. And I, and I talked about yep. the progress we made on homelessness, for example. Mm -hmm. There's no way that if we hadn't partnered bipartisan with uh, Susan Collins and Patty Murray were my two co-chairs uh, or, or chair and ranking member, and we got 
new programs for veterans uh, that are, and, and other homeless folks, those, those are success stories that we don't focus on uh, enough. So, mm -hmm. so those exist, but you would never would have been, done, have been able to do it at that scale with government. The interesting thing about this moment to me is we've just had what I call the new New Deal. We've had $4 trillion of investment passed by Congress in the last few years. Because now of the, the pandemic? Is, partly it was the pandemic, but it was also the infrastructure bill, right? Uh, the Inflation Reduction Act, the biggest climate investment yep. in the history of the country, and the Chips and Science Act to really mm -hmm. bring manufacturing back to the, the country. That's a massive opportunity. Now the question is, who's going to make that work? And I think the private sector is already starting to step up and invest, but I really see enterprise and the nonprofit sector as an incredibly important vehicle to be able to take that promise at scale and, and make it reality on the ground, to make sure it really makes a difference in people's lives. So what do you see as the, uh, the biggest priorities for you? Obviously, you know, you've got your core mission, doing more of that, I'm sure doubling down, but anything that you're thinking of in terms of maybe a shift or what you bring to this role that might be different than any other leader? Well, just to build on, on what I said a moment ago, um, while it may not be immediately obvious that a giant climate investment or an infrastructure investment is a huge opportunity for an organization like Enterprise, but the fact is it could be transformational for the people in the communities that we work with, the people in communities who are too often left behind. And, and we know that inequality has grown in the country. We know that the deep housing challenges we're having right now aren't just bad for our lowest income families, they're bad for our economy. Literally, people can't move to jobs. There's mm -hmm. $150 billion a year that renters are overspending on rent and they can't uh, go out and spend for their kids, right, on their education. Or, or food, or to invest in an economy that's growing. So there's lots of ways that housing is really holding the country back in a way that's, that's profound. But this opportunity, think about this. We have a massive investment in broadband. We now know after the pandemic that if you don't have high-speed internet, it's gonna be very hard for your kids to get educated, for you to yeah. participate in, in a job, for you to get healthcare. So many things are now, that's an investment in our homes, right? And there's a massive opportunity for us. Similarly on, on climate, we know that 10 years from now, uh, wealthier communities are gonna be driving electric cars and have solar on their roofs. They're gonna be saving thousands of dollars a year and they're gonna be healthier because they're gonna get rid of fossil fuel plants in their communities. This is a massive opportunity to invest in homes in where people live, where most of our carbon emissions come from, but to do it in a way that creates jobs, that lowers costs for them, that makes housing more affordable. So I really see this kind of new New Deal moment as a, as a massive opportunity for the country, but, but for enterprise and for affordable housing as well. Let me ask another question, slight non sequitur. Would you ever run for office given the importance of of policy in this scenario? Of course, you're at the beginning of a new job. You May you have decades in that job, but would that be something that would be on your radar at some point? Well, look, I uh, you mentioned uh, I did run for mayor in New York City. Uh, it was obviously not my moment to, to do it, but here's the thing. What, what I love about Enterprise is we are the biggest policy organization on housing and community development in the country. And we do that at the federal level, mm -hmm. we do it at the state and local level, we work with tribal communities and rural areas, but we're not just an advocate or an advisor, we're at, we actually do it. In fact, we're the only organization in housing that has every single aspect uh, that we work in. We, we own and manage affordable housing and we work with those residents, like those kids who are at the after school program I talked about. We invest capital. So we, we not only talk the talk, we walk the walk in terms of, of our work. And I love that combination. And I really think it is 
unique and it's different from being a public official, uh, whether uh, you know in the executive branch as I've been or an elected official, you really do get to work on everything. And, and now's a moment where we need, especially with some of the di dysfunction in Washington, we need uh, organizations like Enterprise to be leading the way on the ground because affordability, literally during the period of COVID, we saw the biggest increase in rents in the history of keeping records. Right. So this has become places like Boise, Idaho, where rents quadrupled. We have we have a, a national challenge, and I think as a result, a national opportunity to move this uh, conversation forward and actually get solutions. So plenty to do on your agenda right now, and uh, look forward to continuing the conversation. We'll leave the political one for another day. That's, you know, TBD. But I really appreciate you taking the time to speak with us, uh, Sean, and good luck. Look forward to um, catching up again. Great to be with you. Thanks for having me. Thanks.